On Sunday, the 1st of March, 1998, a brutal murder took place in the Canadian city of Moncton, New Brunswick. There were uh, a lot of police officers who seemed to be very distraught. A lot of them had said that they had never seen anything like it. The case opened a Pandora's box that shocked not only a community, but an entire country. There's been a ton of stabbings and violent incidents to the point where it looked like there was a serial episode that was beginning to shape us. As well as the police, others also chronicled the investigation on film, on paper, and on tape. Through their lenses, they captured the story of the homicidal drifter. The 24th of April, 1985. In Nova Scotia, Halifax Harbour is home to the province's two major cities, its capital, Halifax, and Dartmouth on the eastern side of the bay. On this particular Tuesday afternoon, 17-year-old Gail Tucker was getting ready to move out of her mother's Dartmouth home and start a new job at a fish processing plant on the province's west coast. Gail had sent her luggage ahead with a friend. All she carried were the clothes she was wearing. Her mother, Mary Lake, offered to pay for the bus trip, but couldn't get the money until the banks opened the next day. Gail decided not to wait, but to hitchhike instead. At five o'clock that afternoon, she climbed into an old car, leaving Dartmouth and her old life behind. Several days later, Mary Lake had not heard from her daughter and notified police, who began to trace Gail's movements across the province. Over the next few months, police identified the old car Gail had hitched in, but it provided them with no new leads. It was just one of several vehicles that had stopped to pick up the hitchhiking teenager. Police eventually tracked Gail to the village of Weymouth, Nova Scotia, where the trail ended. In October 1985, six months after Gail Tucker's disappearance, a man walking his dog in a wooded area south of Weymouth made a gruesome discovery, the skeletal remains of a human body. Police called to the scene also found a pile of clothes nearby. No attempt had been made to bury the corpse and decomposition was such that shovels had to be used to remove the remains. Two days later, the body was identified through dental records and jewelry found at the scene. It was 17-year-old Gail Tucker. Forensics determined that the girl had been stabbed repeatedly in the side with a single-edged blade, but police were unable to link the crime to any suspects. For Gail's family and the police, it was a dead end. But in reality, it was just the beginning. As the years passed, the murder of Gail Tucker became, sadly, just another statistic. One of hundreds of unsolved murders across Canada. By 1998, police in Dartmouth had all but closed the file, keeping it open only at the insistence of the victim's mother, Mary Lake, who still believed that one day they would link a name and a face to the terrible crime. February 1998. In the city of Moncton, it was another humid weekend, typical New Brunswick weather for the time of year. With a population of just over 100,000, Moncton is a city where most people felt safe and secure. Moncton's basically a, a peace-loving sort of a city and, uh, and a very vibrant city. Growing and uh, the people are industrious and, and uh, hardworking. It's a small city, it has a small city mentality. Not small town, not big city. In a building in a quiet neighborhood, 48-year-old Joan Hicks was getting her 11-year-old daughter Nina ready for bed. They'd only been in Moncton for about six months. They'd moved from Musgrave Harbor, Newfoundland, the island province where they'd spent their entire lives. But extraordinary circumstances had given Joan the chance to leave her hometown 
and start a new life in Moncton. She had been helping people who were in trouble with the law in Newfoundland. Uh, one of those people uh, was later convicted for sexual assault and sent to Dorchester Penitentiary. So she was writing letters to her friend. This friend was asking her, there are other people here who would like to get letters. And this is where Aubrey Sparks comes in. Here is a man who was in prison for murdering his wife. She started writing to him. Those letters apparently became love letters. And she decided that she wanted to move to Moncton to be closer to him to see if this relationship would work. Joan's family was deeply concerned that she had never even met Aubrey Sparks. Their only communication had been through telephone calls and the exchange of letters and photographs. All of her family and friends in Musgrave Harbor tried to talk her out of it. They even asked the RCMP to try to dissuade her from coming to Moncton. Joan's grown-up daughter Judy was also very worried. I didn't want her to go, but it was her decision to go to Moncton. That's all we could do. Nina was nervous about moving to a strange new city. Before she left, she gave her aunt a photograph of herself dressed in her Sunday best. If anything happens to me, she said, put up this picture so people will be able to find me and bring me home. Nina was 11, and she uh, loved going to brownies, to church, Sunday school, playing with her friends. There was no good boy. When they got there, they, they called, and that was it. For a while, Joan and Nina lived at a shelter in Moncton. During their stay, Joan befriended a young woman, 22-year-old Tammy McLean. Tammy had been having problems with her boyfriend, and she found in Joan a compassionate heart and a willingness to listen. The shelter helped Joan and Nina find a basement apartment. Residents couldn't help but like their new neighbors, whom they described as friendly, polite, and shy. Nina enrolled in a nearby school and seemed to fit in. Nina called and uh, I asked her about school and she, she liked going to school and they were into their apartment and she seemed to be quite content. Tammy McLean and her boyfriend were often guests at the apartment stopping by for coffee or a game of cards. But on the night of the 28th of February, 1998, Tammy McLean came alone. What we do know is that on that day, Joan Hicks got a call from her friend, Tammy McLean. Tammy was having problems with her boyfriend. She said she needed to get away. So Joan invited her to her apartment. Tammy was obviously distraught. They spent a lot of time talking. Uh, Joan wanted to make sure that she had a place to go, that she wasn't going to be uh, victimized or caught in a situation. At 5 a.m., a taxi pulled up in front of the apartment building. As Tammy left the building and approached the cab, the driver noticed another woman with a man at the entrance. As she pulled away, the driver saw them go back inside the building. The woman standing in the entrance was Joan Hicks, and it was the last time anyone saw her alive. On the 1st of March, 1998, the city of Moncton woke up to another gloomy Sunday. But on this particular morning, the New Brunswick community's small town sensibility was about to be severely shaken. In the early hours of the morning, a man named Glenn Bennett entered a Moncton police station, agitated and very frightened. He told officers that he had just witnessed a brutal murder and could do nothing to stop it. His version of events was he was a terrified spectator at the incident and then he didn't know what to do. But as soon as he got separate 
he went to the police and reported it. The police then go out and find the bodies and matters proceed after that. Just before eight o'clock that morning, residents in one Moncton neighborhood were surprised to see police cars pull up outside an apartment building. Officers asked the building's caretaker to unlock the door to a basement apartment. Inside, police found 48-year-old Joan Hicks lying on the floor near the bathroom in a pool of her own blood. They immediately cordoned off the stairs leading to the basement and began scarring the area for evidence. It was a part of town that, that is just on the border of where it starts to go a little bit downhill. It was number three, basement, of, uh, where just the windows would have looked out onto the street. Joan had been beaten and strangled, and her throat cut with a serrated edge knife. Her 11-year-old daughter Nina was missing. The bed in the bedroom had been slept in, but detectives found it empty. The bedroom wardrobe, however, was not. The little girl was hanging in a closet when she was found. Uh, Hello probably was smothered to death prior to that and then just hung in the closet. It was not a pretty scene. The scene was apparently so gruesome that there was a special psychiatric team that was brought in. Uh, they were very upset. A lot of them had said that they had never seen anything like it. In some crime scenes I'll never forget. You have to build up a certain amount of immunity, otherwise you can't function. And it sounds cold, but that's the reality. You have to. Police talked to Joan's neighbors. One recalled hearing loud voices coming from an apartment, but wasn't sure which one. As word got around, residents of the quiet neighborhood were dumbstruck. Moncton is one of those towns where people really do know each other. This is a place where people still don't lock their doors to this day. So to have something like that happen in that community, it did affect everybody. It's all everybody was talking about. Joan and Nina Hicks had only been in Moncton a short time. Back in their hometown of Musgrave Harbor, Newfoundland, police arrived at the home of Joan's daughter Judy and her two sons. Dylan went to the door and he came and he said, Mom, the cops is in the driveway. It's okay. They're probably just turning around. Tindanak came to the door and uh, it was a star CP officer. And there was a Salvation Army officer and his wife. They come in and they wanted me to sit. At first, you think of an accident. You know, maybe they were in a car accident or something like that. But when I got the news, when I had realized how they died, I was devastated. They had uh, told me there was an eyewitness. The police told Judy that a man named Glenn Bennett had been at her mother's home the night of the murders. I could believe that somebody had watched, been there and watched. But I learned that he was the one that reported it to the police. And that's how they know and killed Mama Nina. Acting on another tip from Glenn Bennett, police converged on a two-story apartment in another part of Moncton, not long after discovering the bodies. It was the home of 22-year-old Tammy McLean. 
but police were more interested in her boyfriend. I learned that he was a friend of mum's, that he would uh, go there and he and his girlfriend, and uh, they were very close with mum, and they uh, would play cards or have coffee, I guess. According to Glenn Bennett, the man responsible for the murders was 34-year-old Michael McGray. If there wasn't an eyewitness, he might have... Michael McGray might have walked away. Police arrested McGray outside the apartment building and brought him to Moncton's provincial courthouse to be charged. The first time I heard the name Michael Wayne McGray was when I had called the RCMP communications person, as we were calling every half hour, and he said, we have a suspect. You get a sense from uh, the bailiffs who are transporting them back and forth how they feel about the person and their level of guilt by how far they park away from the door because the media is waiting with their cameras to get a picture. When they showed up with Michael Wayne McGray, they parked a long ways away from the door. So we did get shots of him handcuffed, being led in up the stairs. Average looking guy, head somewhat down, but he wasn't trying to hide. He knew that he was gonna do the walk and he did the walk. They were pretty sure that this was their man, and uh, that I didn't want any other family to go through what I went through. With the suspect in custody, the courts now had to find out why these terrible murders had taken place. They looked for their answers in the mind of 34-year-old Michael Wayne McGray, but no one was prepared for what they were about to learn. In March 1998, the city of Moncton, New Brunswick, was rocked by a terrible double murder. The victims, Joan Hicks and her daughter Nina, were laid to rest in their hometown of Musgrave Harbour, Newfoundland. Nina's friends placed a white ribbon on her coffin and held a special tribute to say goodbye. Musgrave Harbor is a very small place, and everybody knows everybody, and they were obviously very traumatized by this whole thing. What kind of a human would do this to Mama Nina? How could a man kill a child and mom? He was a drifter. And I think normally, from what I read, a psychopath develop these tendencies when they're young. Michael Wayne McGray's criminal record came under scrutiny as Moncton detectives investigated his previous convictions. Michael McGray had spent much of his childhood in group homes and reform school. In his early teens, he was kicked out of his father's home and began drifting from one city to the next. As an adult, he was in and out of jail, mostly for robbery and other property offences. One of those crimes was committed 140 kilometres from Moncton, in the city of St John. In November 1987, a St John taxi driver working the night shift stopped to pick up three men. In the late 80s, uh, St John was uh a very uh, much an industrial city and our investigators uh, certainly investigated a lot more crime with respect to violence than they would be uh, doing today. Essentially what happened, um, three people uh, got together and conjured up a plan to rob a taxi driver. One of the men, Mark Daniel Gibbons, sat in the front seat beside the driver while his two accomplices Michael Wayne McGray and Norman Warren got in the back. When they got to the location, they informed the taxi driver that it wasn't uh, his normal drive today. He was being robbed. He 
he made a motion to go into his pocket. But Mark Gibbon uh, had a knife and was able to stab the cab driver in the hand with the knife. Police arrived at the scene and began searching for the three suspects. The first one they found was Mark Gibbons, but it was too late for an arrest. He made his way down to uh, Market Square, which is a mall in, in St. John, and he was found actually by a janitor who summons mall security, who in fact summons us, and he had expired. Investigators quickly established the cause of death, a single stab wound just below the heart. The, the wound actually was just below, uh, just at the very tip of the heart, and uh, he bled out essentially what happened. But he was obviously going for help. In a matter of minutes, a botched robbery had become a bizarre murder with no clear motive. The next day, it turned even more unusual when the murdered man's accomplices called the police themselves. They make a phone call to the police station wanting to know if we knew the whereabouts or if we heard from Mark Gibbon. Well, at that time, we have a murder scene, and uh, so we're very intrigued by the phone call. We traced the phone call back to this Jermaine Street apartment. Our officers arrived there, and some people uh, leave the back door running. Police arrested Mark Gibbons' accomplices in the taxi robbery, who were now also murder suspects. At this point, McGray had had a few run-ins with the law, mainly for breaking and entering. Norman Warren had a long record of violent crime, including the murder of a cab driver, for which he served 17 years. McGray told police that Warren had stabbed Mark Gibbons for botching the robbery. Combined with statements made by the girlfriends of the three men, police were confident that they had their man. The investigators of the day talked to all the potential witnesses, basically females that were in the apartment, and um, they sort of sided with the position that Warren, in fact, was probably the one that uh, committed the murder. Norman Warren was then charged with the homicide of Mark Gibbon, went through trial, and uh, he was found not guilty. Detectives on the case were shocked by the decision. Norman Warren was behind bars, but for attempted robbery. McGray also received a five-year sentence for his role in the robbery. In 1998, lawyer Wendell Maxwell was charged with defending Michael McGray for the murder of Joan and Nina Hicks. But as the trial date approached, word had it that Joan and Nina may not have been Michael McGray's first victims. The source was McGray himself. At some point in prison, as Michael Wayne McGray was being interviewed, he made a plea bargain with the police officers. We found out that he had confessed to killing two gay men in Montreal in the early 90s. At the time in question, Montreal police were baffled by a string of violent stabbing deaths in the homosexual community. Over a 12-month period, six men had been murdered. In Montreal's gay village, there was growing concern. In May 1991, local gay activists held a meeting demanding that police review the details about what they feared was a serial killer stalking homosexuals in Montreal. That fear was compounded by the unsolved murders of two more gay men that autumn, both stabbed to death while taking late-night bike rides in the city parks. Pierre Sangolo, director of the major crime section of the Montreal Urban Community of Police, ordered the files to be pulled for the first six killings. By the end of 1993, intensive police investigations concluded that while there were links between some of the killings, they were not the work of just one person. We could be talking about two serial killers or we could be talking about one group of serial killers. The investigation did little to allay the fears of the city's gay community. Between 1989 and 1996, 
21 gay men had been murdered in Montreal. By the autumn of 1997, six of those murders were still unsolved. At the time of his confession in 1999, there was no evidence to suggest that McGray had any role in the killings. In fact, he'd been eliminated as a suspect as he was in prison at the time. But then McGray revealed that on Good Friday, the 29th of March, 1991, released on a three-day pass, he traveled to Montreal and made a required visit to a halfway house in the city's north end. The next day, McGray went to Montreal's gay village where he met recently retired teacher Robert Assley in a bar. They had a few drinks and talked about sport. Then Robert invited McGray back to his apartment. At Robert's apartment, the two men had a few more drinks and watched television until McGray fell asleep on Robert's couch. When McGray woke up at six o'clock on Easter Sunday, he heard Robert getting dressed in his bedroom and grabbed a knife from the kitchen. He ordered the retired school teacher to lie down on the floor, but Robert just laughed at him. McGray struck him on the head with a lamp, then stabbed him repeatedly in the chest and the throat. He left the apartment with some alcohol, but didn't touch Robert's wallet or credit cards. It would be a week before Robert Astley's body was found. But the story didn't end there. Within 24 hours of killing Robert Astley, Michael McGray was already stalking his next victim. He returned to the gay village and met unemployed salesman Gaetan Etier. Gaetan invited McGray back to his small bachelor apartment to share a bottle of wine and watch a hockey game. McGray later told police that after turning down an advance from Gaetan, he watched him pass out on a sofa bed and continued to watch him for the rest of the night. The next morning, McGray walked over to the bed and smashed a beer bottle against Gaetan Etier's head, then attacked him with a knife. Fighting back, Gaetan tried to get to the phone, but McGray cut the line. When Gaetan was dead, McGray left the apartment with the bottle of wine that the two men were supposed to share the night before. He then left Montreal, breaking the conditions of his three-day pass. Later that month, McGray was arrested and returned to jail. In his confession, he revealed details that only the killer could have known, such as the beer bottle and the cut phone line, held back evidence that the police never released to the public. It was a startling confession, but it would not be the last. McGray went on to tell police officers that he was also responsible for a murder in New Brunswick. In 1999, I received a telephone call from an investigator here in Moncton uh, inquiring um, had we uh, had a homicide uh, with respect to a, a chap by the name of Mark Gibbon. And sure enough, there was an unsolved homicide. Uh, we did charge somebody to go through the court system and the person was found not guilty. And we went to Renews Prison, which is uh, here in, in the province of New Brunswick, uh, maximum security prison, and I had a meeting with uh, Mr. McGray. And he said, I want you to know something right now, and this is before this, the, the, the actual confession unfolded. He said, I am not doing this because I had emotions or I feel bad for anybody. And as a result of the, uh, the conversation with uh, Michael, uh, we obtained a very detailed uh, confession uh, where he, in fact, was the person that stabbed Mark Gibbon and uh, caused his death. St. John, New Brunswick. According to McGray, on the night of the 14th of November, 1987, he, Mark Gibbons, and Norman Warren all planned to rob a taxi. When things went wrong, the three men took off on foot. Warren was the slowest, and McGray and Gibbons soon left him behind. Not far from the city's YMCA, they stopped to catch their breath. At that point, the Gray took this homemade fashion knife and stabbed uh, Gibbon in the chest, just below the heart, once. 
uh, put him to his knees. Uh, McGray was upset that the robbery was a botched robbery. But he also talks about the fact that when he met Gibbons, he didn't like him. And he knew he was going to do something to him, but he didn't know he was going to kill him. McGray left Gibbons to die, and later met up with Norman Warren. They make their way back to the house, and uh, all three of them had quasi-girlfriends, and the girls were starting to ask, where, where did Mark go? But at some point, um, McGray shows the girls a knife, this old knife with blood on it, and passed it to the girls and told the girls to clean it up. After their arrest, McGray used Norman Warren's violent past to pin the murder on him, with the help of witnesses. He had told the girls that he, he was the one that killed uh, Gibbon, but that it was important that they stick by him and uh, not tell. And they told as much as they could possibly tell without implicating McGray. Unfortunately, these women are women that have um, abused alcohol and drugs. These women suffered a lot of violence over their lives. And they were very afraid of McGray if he's killed, and they were sure that he'd killed somebody. Um, he would actually do that to them. Although McGray's confession was astounding, Reed and his partner had to corroborate everything the suspect had told them. And uh, two of the witnesses, uh, certainly, uh, when we went back and, and spoke to them afterwards, told us everything he did and said. Uh, it was very easy to, to lay the murder charge. By the time the trial for the murders of Joan and Nina Hicks was set to begin, McGray had also been charged with the deaths of Mark Gibbons and the two men in Montreal. The media was now referring to Michael Wayne McGray as a serial killer. You don't hear that too often in Canada. It certainly was uh, snowballing because uh, McGray was uh, he was sort of uh, cooperating with the media at certain points in, in releasing information uh, on homicides. What wasn't clear, however, was the tie that bound the McGray murders together. Serial killers usually choose victims of a similar type, yet there was no apparent link between the murders in Moncton and those in St. John and Montreal. On Monday the 20th of March 2000, Two years after the brutal slaying of Joan Hicks and her daughter Nina, 35-year-old Michael McGray surprised a Moncton courtroom by pleading guilty to the murder of Joan Hicks. He didn't want to go to trial. He wanted to plead guilty to the murder of the mother. And so consequently, I made motions before the court, and he pled guilty to that uh, particular charge. But there was no emotion in the plea. He had some emotion about going to trial, but not about her, per se. In his statement, McGray described how he spent the day taking cocaine with acquaintance Glenn Bennett. He told of becoming overwhelmed with an urge to kill somebody, anybody. McGray and Bennett then went to the home of Joan Hicks. His girlfriend was at mom's that night, and uh, he came, asked his girlfriend to, well, Home, I guess, and she did, and uh, he went to the washroom and uh, saw out to mom. He wanted toilet paper. So mom went to the closet to get him the, the toilet paper, and this is when he killed mom. I learned that he strangled her. And that he uh, cut her throat to do the job. McGray refused, however, to admit to the murder of Nina Hicks. He was adamant about not pleading guilty with respect to the 11 year old child, Nina. My guess uh, is that child murderers in, in the penitentiary have a very difficult time. They're less than a human being in the sight of other inmates. The first degree murder charge for the killing of Joan Hicks carried a life sentence with little chance for parole. The prosecution decided to suspend proceedings in the second murder pending further investigation. 
It was hard. Very hard when we got the news. I was very proud in one way. You know, he's going to jail for first degree murder for mom. But Nina was like nobody. Michael McGray had now been implicated in five different murders. But worse was to come. Police discovered there were more. On the 20th of March 2000, Michael Wayne McGray pleaded guilty to the murder of Joan Hicks. What was even more surprising was his willingness to confess to three additional stabbing deaths, one of which went back more than a decade. While being transported to prison, McGray told a police officer that he was willing to confess to 11 other killings in cities across Canada and in Seattle, Washington. In exchange, he wanted immunity from prosecution and medical help to control an overwhelming need to kill. When police refused to meet his terms, McGray turned to the national media. And what amounted to about uh, a 15 minute uh, interview with him and it blew me away. I can remember listening to his answers, listening to how detached he was. There was uh, no ranting, there was no raving, it was, it absolutely blew me away as to how detached and unemotional he was. As though he was just talking about going to the grocery store and what he had picked up. It's just something that I really enjoy doing. And I mean, when it comes out, I mean, some of these murders were just horrendous, right? Everybody asks me, you know, I have any remorse for the victims, and I'm not going to bore you. I don't. I don't regret it, and I don't have any remorse. The only thing I regret, really, is that it ended. Several times during the interview, McGray talked about an irresistible craving to kill and his need to hurt people, to satisfy this hunger deep inside. He went on to describe drifting from Vancouver to Halifax, stalking the areas where junkies and prostitutes hung out, and gay districts where strangers were easy targets. What we know of serial killers is that there's usually some kind of a pattern. There's a certain type of person they murder. In Michael Wayne McGray's case, his motivation was a need to kill. Who he killed doesn't really seem to matter. You know, I asked him, I said, what you know, people want to really know is, like, do you have conscience? And you know, he said that you know, he was grappling with uh, the whole idea of conscience. It bothered him that, you know, it didn't bother him, which most normal people would say, what? It was just, it, 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 it was, again, it was so surreal. As surreal as it seemed, McGray's next admission was a bombshell. I asked him, you know, what was your first murder? And he said it was Gail Tucker in Nova Scotia. Gail Tucker was a 17-year-old uh, girl who just happened to be hitchhiking and had the unfortunate luck of running across Michael McGray and a companion in a truck. And you know, he just gave a very brief, very um, dispassionate description of, of what happened. Me and another guy were driving, we just picked her up, she was hitchhiking, and uh, we stopped, I pulled her out of the truck, stabbed her, and left her. It wasn't much to remember. It took my breath away. But it took my breath away because of just how absolutely devoid of emotion it was. Over the next two months, McGray pleaded guilty to the murders of Robert Astley and Gaetan Etier in Montreal and the murder of robbery accomplice Mark Gibbons in St. John. 
A year later, in May 2001, McGray finally faced the murder charge of Nina Hicks after her family requested that the stay be lifted by the prosecution. I uh, wrote a letter to the Attorney General. So they called us back and they were going to take him to trial for Nina. But he appeared and there was no trial. He just uh, went to a court hearing and uh, pleaded guilty. A few days later, in a Halifax courtroom, based on his own confession and corroborating evidence, McGray pleaded guilty to the 1985 murder of hitchhiker Gail Tucker. They questioned him with respect to what he knew, whether it would match the physical evidence they had, because the police had a lot of information that was never released. Based on this information, they proceeded and laid the first-degree murder charge against Michael McRae. In court, Gail Tucker's family heard details of the teenager's final moments. How, after she refused to provide oral sex, McGray dragged her from the truck, ripped off her clothes, then stabbed her repeatedly when her struggling infuriated him. And how he and a mystery accomplice dragged her body into the woods. Don't have enough evidence to establish who was with him. From what I've read, from my personal uh, belief, I don't think anyone had anything else to do with it other than him. McGray was again sentenced to life in prison to run concurrently with his five other sentences. For Gail's mother, Mary Lake, it had been a long, painful road. Her mother spent from 1985 to 2001 trying to find who murdered her daughter. I think they were at a dead end for a great deal of the time. But they, the file was put together with respect to the physical evidence and everything, and it was, it was kept alive, in other words. It was always active because of her persistence. Michael Wayne McGray is currently serving his time at the Atlantic Maximum Security Facility in Renew, New Brunswick. He stated that if given the chance, he will murder a guard, another prisoner, anyone who can satisfy his uncontrollable craving to kill. From his own experience, McGray's lawyer, Wendell Maxwell, knows this is no idle threat. I went to see him just to go over what was going to happen in Halifax and what to put in the interview room. I was there probably half an hour, 45 minutes to talk to him. Then I left. When they searched him, they found a homemade shiv. Knife. Guy said, Michael, what was this for? And he said, oh, I was, I was going to do Wendell. If I'd have been alone with him, I probably would not be doing this interview with you today. That's why I really believe that Michael's a psychopath. He has no conscience. He acts on impulse. He doesn't sit and weigh whether it's right or wrong. It's just the impulse, and when it's done, it's done. There's no conscience. There's nothing after that. That's the way Michael was with these murders. I don't think they've necessarily accurately established whether or not he actually did all of the 16 murders that he claimed. My opinion is it doesn't really matter. Numbers don't matter. Numbers don't matter to Gail Tucker's family. Numbers don't matter to the Hicks family who lost, you know, their daughter and their granddaughter. You know, I it just, to me, the numbers are irrelevant. He took everything away from me. All the family I had was mom and Nina. It changed my family. It changed everything. You live day by day, and they're always in your mind. Always.